Oh, hi. You caught me wrenching around on a vintage vehicle. Speaking of vintage vehicles, let's talk about the time that Marvel Comics tried to make a comic about a bunch of motorcycle riders, Team America, and how it utterly failed. Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. In 1972, Marvel launched Ghost Rider, capturing the cultural zeitgeist on both occult stories and motorcycle culture. Leading up to 1972, we had supernatural horror movies like 1968's Rosemary's Baby. We had the 1971 book launch of The Exorcist. In 1969, there was the popular biker movie Easy Rider, and Evil Knievel was a superstar stuntman motorcyclist who began performing publicly in 1966. So Ghost Rider just launched at the right time. That was a story of a demonically powered biker, and of course it had an iconic visual design courtesy of Mike Plug. So just 10 years later, Marvel thought, hey, maybe we can capture lightning in a bottle twice when they decided to launch another comic book based on motorcycle heroes, Team America. 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 Uh, no, not that Team America. This one lasted 12 issues and utterly failed. Let's try to take a look at why. But before I go too far, a quick word from the sponsor of this episode. These days, one of the best ways to protect yourself and your computer when you're online is with a VPN, a virtual private network, and NordVPN has the fastest speeds out there. With NordVPN, you can take your cybersecurity to the next level and block trackers and malware. It's simple, safe, and affordable. You can enable either a single-click sign-on or zero clicks so that you're always automatically protected. Whether you're connected at home or using a mobile device on public Wi-Fi, NordVPN gives you secure private access that blocks your IP and doesn't feature any logs of your browser history. One of my favorite options is access to over 5,400 servers around the world. For instance, I recently wanted to watch the latest season of Rick and Morty, but it wasn't available on any of my streaming services, at least not here in the US. But with NordVPN, I simply changed my server to one in the UK, and then when I logged into my Netflix account, boom, now I can watch the latest season safely and legally. I'm confident that all of you could benefit from this, so use my promo code COMICTROPES or visit the link in the description below. And now, on with the show. Our story starts out in 1974 when Marvel partnered with toy manufacturer Ideal to make an issue of Evil Knievel, who was the basis for a line of stunt cycle toys with the company. We then fast forward to 1977 when Evil Knievel got himself in a lot of trouble and lost a lot of his sponsorships, including his Ideal toys. Knievel's former manager, Shelley Saltman, wrote an unflattering biography about the stuntman. So Knievel tracked him down. Even though he was recovering from a crash and had both arms in casts, he beat Saltman with a baseball bat. The fallout was immediate. It took Ideal a while to recover and rebrand. Eventually, they redesigned the toy and named it Team America, with a red, white, and a blue cyclist. And to promote it, they returned to Marvel Comics, looking to launch a comic book based on their product. Editor-in-Chief Jim Shooter had been having success with comics based on toys. Micronauts and Rom Space Knight launched in 1979, and Shogun Warrior started in 1980. Thus, in 1982, Marvel was ready to launch Team America with characters created by Shooter and writer Ed Hannigan. So, of course, the first appearance was issue... 269 of Captain America. It was shortly into the underrated Captain America run by writer J.M. DeMatteis and artist Mike Zeck that all of a sudden Team America showed up. What did a bunch of motorcyclists have to do with Captain America? Honestly, not much. So I did ask writer J.M. DeMatteis on Twitter if it was mandated and he confirmed that yeah, it absolutely was. This was a lot more than Marvel had done to promote the launch of books like Rom Space Knight, or also in 1982, G.I. Joe. 
De Mateus did what he could to make the appearance work. Captain America is well known for riding a motorcycle, so the issue features Cap doing a small performance in a charity stunt show. Team America are there, and everyone admires one another until a monster flies in and transports the four heroes. They find themselves in a town full of famous people from the past, like Mark Twain and Albert Einstein. The villain behind things is the Mad Thinker, and he's created an entire town of robot duplicates of famous people. But the heroes trash the robots and are aided by the mysterious Black Marauder, who will become an important part of Team America's story. The next month, their title launched. The best part of it is probably the cover, which was laid out by Frank Miller and finished by Bob Layton. The issue credits the writer as Jim Shooter with artwork by Mike Vosberg. The title will not keep a consistent creative team, which is probably part of why the book didn't succeed in the same way that books like Rom Space Night or G.I. Joe did. The latter two titles featured Bill Mantlo and Larry Hama as the writer from beginning to end. Team America begins with a prologue featuring the Black Marauder breaking into the headquarters of Universal Technologies and stealing files on something called New Genesis. Remember that for later. The Marauder then escapes some police with a really cool jump across a ravine. We cut to a meeting with terrorist group Hydra, who secretly run Universal Technologies. Hydra then talks about how they want to steal a motorcycle designed by a man with the improbable name Pops Kuramoto. The book then introduces us to the three main characters one at a time. First up is Wolverine knockoff El Lobo, the Wolf. He likes to often say and think his own name twice. He's walking around a racetrack when a Hydra agent tries and fails to blow him up. Wolf stumbles on a note addressed to him. Next is James McDonald, not to be confused with Marvel's Canadian superhero, James McDonald Hudson. James McDonald is a former CIA operative who decided he'd rather ride motorcycles. An assassin throws a knife at him, but he avoids it and finds a note in his hotel room. Finally, we meet Winthrop Rowan Jr., who calls himself Are You Ready? Yeah. This guy decided that he was going to give himself a new name, but rather than come up with something, I don't know, arguably cool like uh, Slade Power, he decided the most impactful thing he could do was come up with a pun. Are you ready? Not awesome. Sounds like something you'd use in a prank call. Arguably, the only other thing I can think of is he gave himself some sort of impressive name like Remington Ulysses ready, uh, but that's just too long and he decided to shorten it to are you ready? Finally realized that he sounded like a nincompoop, but was too embarrassed to change it. A Hydra agent tries to shoot are you ready, but fails. And once again, the character finds a note addressed to him. These three men never really get any deeper. We never delve into their pasts or find any real internal conflict within them. They all like riding motorcycles. The most conflict just comes from are you ready enjoying stunt riding, while Wolf argues that the man is more important than the bike. The three motorcyclists meet up at a warehouse where they learn each of them received a note from someone called the Marauder. Intriguingly, the three men have a sense that they know one another even though they've never met. They then talk about joining to become a race team for a relay race, but they also squabble a lot, which will become a tiresome trait of this supposed team throughout the entire run. In fact, the wolf bends a steel wrench with his bare hands as he threatens the other men. That feat of incredible strength is never really explained. In fact, what the book does is give you a lot of red herrings, teasing that the Black Marauder could be person A, B, or C from the team, but ultimately, all I can say is you can follow the clues, they will never reveal who the Black Marauder is. You, you just cannot reason it out. And I think that's a product of the fact that this creative team will shift. There are a bunch of different writers involved in the 12 issues. So I don't think anybody ever had a clear plan of exactly what they were going to do. Anyway, Team America is formed. They decide to participate in the relay race, which also just happens to feature Pops Kuramoto and his superbike. The relay race takes place and, of course, our main characters win. Hydra then emerges to abduct Pops and he explains to the wolf 
that they want his bike because it has a guidance system that allows a rider to ride perfectly, which kind of sounds like cheating in a race, but then again, he didn't win. And look at how stupid Hydra is. They were told to abduct the man who wins the race because they assumed Pops Kuramoto would have to win. But instead, the wolf won, and Hydra is utterly confused. They also bring in armies of soldiers, tanks, and a blimp. But not just any blimp. A blimp with a tractor beam that begins to abduct Pops. Why they didn't use this before the race is anyone's guess. Are you ready? Jumps aboard the tract of land that's being lifted up into the blimp along with Pops Kuramoto. The blimp ends up crashing, but instead of being a disaster like the Hindenburg, everyone aboard is somehow fine. Well, alive. The Black Marauder got in there somehow and is single-handedly beating up a team of Hydra agents. Meanwhile, the three Team America team members beat up the old man who led Hydra's plan. And the man bites down on a cyanide capsule, killing himself. The issue ends with Pop Kuramoto's bike destroyed, and he claims he can never recreate it because it only worked accidentally. What a cool invention. Issue 1 isn't great, but apparently there was an original draft that was even worse. At the last minute, Jim Shooter saw it and deemed it completely unacceptable for print. So, he gathered together a bunch of Marvel staffers and overnight, page by page, panel by panel, Jim Shooter rewrote the entire book. He talked about it on his blog, saying, Team America was such a train wreck that I had to assemble a crew to rework it literally overnight. It was that bad, amateurish, and embarrassing. It was a toy license, and I could not allow it to go to the licensor for approval in the state Denny O'Neill left it in. I took the book away from him. I doubt that his name appeared in the credits. Probably the original writer's name was taken off too, since what he wrote was unusable. Back in 2012, Brian Cronin from Comic Book Resources asked writer and editor Tom DeFalco about this, and DeFalco explained that he hosted the all-night rework session at his apartment and witnessed Shooter cutting up and rearranging panels on the fly. Issue 2's credit shows us that the book now has three writers. In addition to Jim Shooter, both Denny O'Neill and Bill Mantlo are credited. All three have written pretty good stuff but somehow they add up to less than the sum of their parts. It introduces us to two new team members. One is Wrench, a genius mechanic who lives in a trailer with his girlfriend Georgina. He joins the team by interrupting the wolf as he fights a random bike gang. The other new team member is Cowboy, who introduces himself by lassoing up Honcho while he's hitting on a girl. Cowboy claims that Honcho will be engaged for the evening, breaking in a new team member. Interesting undertones there. Cowboy basically just says he's part of the team and it's accepted because he probably had a toy out there in the real world. He didn't. This time, a generic assassin is hired to kill Team America with the goal of drawing out the Black Marauder. On the cover, the assassin seems to have some sort of pogo stick vehicle. On the interior, it's a flying platform. The villain is also a racist, but he fails. Black Marauder shows up to beat up some people that were a threat to Team America, and Team America wins a race, but this time are driving a dune buggy. Were they really already out of motorcycle ideas by issue two? Well, maybe. All I can say is that the next two issues are utterly insane, and if you're going to read anything about Team America, read issues three and four. Issue 3 is credited to Bill Mantlo as the sole writer. Luke McDonnell is now the artist. And we meet the villains who show up here and never again. Mr. Mayhem, who dresses like some sort of court jester, has brought together Mr. Magic, a guy in a kid's birthday magician outfit, Mr. Muscle, a guy with a beer gut, and Mr. Mind, some sort of deformed weirdo who stole the name of a famous Captain Marvel villain. Mr. Mayhem tells these sad weirdos that their job is to figure out who the Marauder is and what their connection may be to Team America. Team America participates in a race, surprise, and all five of them finish at the same time. Then, while celebrating, the bad guys somehow use magic and science to trap them all in some sort of weird shape. I don't know what to call this. 
The Marauder chases the bad guys back to their secret lair, avoids a bunch of traps, and battles the mayhem criminals. Mr. Magic has the Marauder on the ropes, but somehow Marauder makes his motorcycle drive independently and knock down Mr. Magic. Marauder never exhibits this power again. It's almost like no one was paying attention to the lore they were creating. Ultimately, Black Marauder fights Mr. Muscle, who has a staff that short circuits the prisons that are holding Team America. And now the Team America team gets to gang up on Mr. Mayhem. The issue ends with people wondering where Wolf was when Marauder was around. Keep in mind, we have seen Wolf lift oil barrels that would weigh hundreds of pounds. Most issues end with the team either wondering where one of them was or yelling at one another. These guys kinda hate one another. It's not fun to be around them. Issue four is one of the craziest Marvel comics I've ever read, so it really didn't surprise me to see that Bill Mantlo wrote it. It's very much in his wheelhouse. He talks about the dangers of arcade games. And after reading this issue, I'm not convinced that Bill Mantlo ever played an arcade game, let alone even saw one. Issue four begins with a kid runaway hiding in an arcade after it closes. The owners come in and the kid witnesses how these guys power their games. Not with electricity, but with the brain power of kidnapped children who have to live in the arcade cabinets. What possible punchline could I come up with that would top the insanity of what you just witnessed? The owners realize one of the kids has died and are about to grudgingly put an out of order sign up on the machine until they find the runaway and decide to turn him into a battery. This issue is a solo story for Wolf. A kid runs up to him at the racetrack and explains that his brother is missing. That's the runaway. Wolf decides to investigate because he knew this family from his old neighborhood, which is illustrated as though it's part of a decrepit war zone. After talking to the family, a biker gang attacks Wolf, he easily defeats them, and he's lucky enough that they know where the kids have gone missing, sending him to the arcade. Wolf isn't exactly Sherlock Holmes, but he is lucky. Wolf witnesses a little girl going into the arcade, and it closes without her leaving. Turns out, the arcade owners are now meeting up with gangsters with plans to franchise around the country. Wolf tries to beat them up, but is instantly tied up. The gangsters decide the best way to cover up the operation is to tie all of the kids to a roller coaster with a bomb that will activate once it's rattled too much. This plan does seem overly elaborate, doesn't it? But keep in mind, it's coming from villains who thought that it would be cheaper to abduct children and use them as a battery rather than just pay for a little bit of electricity. Of course, Black Marauder shows up, jumps over all the roller coaster cars, and knocks the bomb into the arcade ending the threat. The next several issues give solo stories to each team member, I guess with the goal of fleshing them out a bit. Alan Kupperberg takes over for the art chores on the next issue about Honcho. I suspect he was rushed because when we look at this panel where Honcho has to defuse a bomb, it looks like Honcho is having a stroke. Issue six is all about Are You Ready? And he's chased by living green slime, which we first see dissolving a dog. Gross. Fortunately, Reddy can jump a river of slime and blows up some poor trucker's livelihood to burn the slime. I guess he's lucky that slime is apparently flammable. Issue six apparently also had a shorter than usual story because it has extra pages that are literally trying to teach you how to ride a motorcycle. For instance, this page has Honcho and Cowboy telling you how to do a jump on a motorcycle. This information was also published in How to Break Your Neck magazine. Issue 7 jumps back to Luke McDonald on artwork. The story features Cowboy performing a stunt that seems completely impossible, lighting his lasso on fire, and jumping through it backwards. But hey, if we can't give these guys stunts, what can we give them? Issue 8 changes the creative team once again. Jim Shooter is back as plotter with Mantlo on script. Artist this time is Don Perlin. Changing the creative team so much is a surefire way to be inconsistent and alienate readers. The story features more infighting with the team and a new subplot. Wrench's girlfriend Georgina begins to disappear with Cowboy, and we see Wrench cry. It's not a lot of fun. Issue 9 is a bit of fun. Uh, same creative team as issue 8, except 
Mark Bright steps in to do the artwork, and I would argue he was the best artist across the 12 issues that got published. I think that Jim Shooter was getting more directly involved at this point in time in a bid to save the license, save the book, and I think that he might have had some specific ideas on who the Black Marauder was. This issue features more in fighting with the team. It features Georgina missing some more. It also features the Marauder riding up a bridge and looking over New York City to ponder. Most of Marauder's appearances feature him appearing to save Team America. But issue one and this issue, both written by Shooter, feature the Marauder doing something independently, having his own agency. Again, keep that in mind. Issue nine features Wrench making a car that blows up. Whoops. But because the plot has to move forward, an executive from Tony Stark's company stops by and still offers Wrench a job. With all the fighting, Wrench takes the job only to ultimately realize their contract gives Stark access to all of his creations, including the Black Marauder's bike. The Marauder breaks into Stark's company that night to take his bike back, but encounters Iron Man. However, instead of fighting, Iron Man immediately realizes the silent Marauder just wants his own bike back. This leads Tony Stark to fire his executive and give Team America a ton of money. A fight with Iron Man might have been a little bit more fun. I do think it's interesting to note that Black Marauder is portrayed as completely silent and dressed head to toe in black. I feel that's very reminiscent of G.I. Joe's breakout character, Snake Eyes. I suspect, and this is pure speculation, but I suspect Marvel may have noticed that G.I. Joe had this breakout character at the same time and may have tried to mimic some of those qualities. Issue 10 is completely forgettable, with Team America dealing with a cult leader that has magic dust that can evaporate people. Going up against a supervillain like that makes it sort of seem like Team America is punching above their weight class. But issue 11 finally gives us the crossover that makes the most sense when the team meets Ghost Rider. Issue 11 features Jim Shooter taking over as writer completely, now working with Tom DeFalco. The artwork by Dave Simons is my least favorite of the run. People just look kind of weird to me, but that's also just my tastes. The plot is simple. Team America is involved in a race that also features Johnny Blaze, who is secretly Ghost Rider. There's also a creepy subplot where Wolf wins over a girl who looks really young, and her parents want to kill Wolf, and they turn out to be Hydra agents, which brings Hydra in later. Wolf dumps this girl right away. So now it's time. Marvel's newest motorcycle hero, the Marauder, versus their most famous and iconic motorcycle hero, Ghost Rider. It could not be more disappointing. Marauder hangs out in the desert at night doing nothing. Somehow, Ghost Rider knows where he is and drives up to meet him. Marauder says nothing, which pisses Ghost Rider off. He smashes a rock, he's so angry. And then... He turns back to Johnny Blaze and tells Marauder to leave, which he does. The next day is the big race, and during the event, Ghost Rider emerges again. Marauder appears, and Ghost Rider attacks him, but as to why, it's never clear. However, this instantly grabs the attention of Hydra, who again launch a major attack. However, Ghost Rider and Team America make short work of them. Afterwards, the team finds the unconscious body of Marauder, who unmasks in the final panel. So here we go. It's time for the final issue, where we're going to find out who the Marauder is. And the answer is mildly satisfying. But if you use the clues that you've been given, there's really no way you could have figured this out. The Marauder unmasks, and it's Georgina. Except she claims to have no memory of being the Marauder. And she's telling the truth. She reveals she can ride because she's been taking secret lessons with Cowboy, but a Hydra leader defects and explains where the Marauder came from. Hydra ran Project New Genesis to produce a superhuman. They secretly administered mutagens to people around the world, including the parents of the five members of Team America. And it worked. The five members of Team America are mutants like the X-Men, except their power only works subconsciously and together. They can psychically place their abilities on a sixth person, and that becomes the Marauder. 
No word on where the bike or costume come from. But when in trouble, they were secretly turning Georgina into Marauder. And presumably other people since the Marauder appeared before we even met Georgina. It's not a great superpower when you consider we have five fantastic bike riders whose power is to summon a sixth fantastic bike rider. And as to why the Marauder would have broken in and stolen those new Genesis plans, why did he assemble the team in the first place? Why did he drive up that bridge and look out over New York and ponder things? Honestly, it doesn't make sense with what we now know. I suspect that no one ever really had a clear idea of whether the Marauder was going to be a team member or whether it was something supernatural, and they just had to whip something together at the last minute. The issue ends with the team deciding to disband now that the Hydra threat is over. They meet for the final time for a very silly wedding between Wrench and Georgina, where everyone is on their bikes. But this was not the end of Team America. Issue 12 of their title came out in January of 1983. Two months later, their story was continued in The New Mutants of all places. Issue 5 was written by Chris Claremont and featured the New Mutants going to a carnival where the original three members of Team America are having a get-together for charity. The event is attacked by Viper, the new leader of Hydra. So much for Hydra's threat against Team America being over. Hydra successfully abducts the Black Marauder thanks to the help of Silver Samurai, but later it's revealed to be Dany Moonstar, one of the New Mutants, and of course she doesn't remember being the Marauder. You'd think the New Mutants leader, Professor X, would instantly involve the X-Men. Instead, he completely abandoned the New Mutants. Professor X approaches Team America and tells them they're mutants and he needs to train them. He psychically tells the New Mutants that training Team America is the most important thing right now. Sunspot gets mad at Professor X basically abandoning them, and he's like, Sorry, I'm making a tough choice. See ya. Ultimately, in the following issue, the New Mutants go off on their own and save their teammate, while Professor X trains Team America. When the New Mutants are successful, Professor X mentally meets them and is like, Hey, you weren't supposed to go off on missions yet, but since you were successful, it's okay this time. We next see Professor X in Team America two issues later for a quick shot of him training the team in the Danger Room. But then, Team America never came back as a more powerful team. They were supporting characters in two issues of The Thing, where he auditioned to join them, but decided it wasn't for him. For those issues, they called themselves the Thunder Riders because Marvel was no longer working with Ideal, who owned the name Team America. The Thing quits the team only a few pages into the following issue, and we've never seen the Thunder Riders again. So if licensed books like G.I. Joe and ROM could work, if motorcycle heroes like Ghost Rider could work, why didn't Team America work? I would honestly say it ultimately comes down to the fact that the creative team was never consistent. I don't think there was a clear vision behind the book. Things just kept changing a little bit too much. It was being made up on the fly. There was no idea behind the scenes. Um, and visually, you know, Team America just cannot compare to somebody like Ghost Rider. That said, if you're very curious about Team America, I would basically just recommend reading issues three and four. They're some of the most bonkers books out there. And then, if you're curious, uh, the issues of New Mutants are also pretty good. Yes, Professor X is pretty weird in that issue, if not an absolute jerk. But the issue's written by Chris Claremont. So the characterizations of the main characters is good. There's good action. That stuff's kind of fun. And hey, at the end of the day, at least Team America was not US-1, which was about a trucker who had a CB radio implanted in his head. It could have always been worse. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you next uh, week with another new episode. By the way, if you'd like this shirt, this is one that I've got in my uh, links below the description. This is a shirt I've got for sale. Thank you again to my sponsor, but a supreme thank you to my patrons you guys really do make every episode possible it's a it's a big big help i really appreciate it i had fun with this one i hope you did too i will see you next time until then keep reading comics
thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks. Didn't quite get that. Didn't quite get that sentence to be real. Let's let's try that all over again. They then jump. So he led an overnight session. I'm stuttering too much. <laughs> because Jim Shooter gathered together. No, I almost had it. Almost had it. And now the Team America team gets to gang up on Mr. Mayhem. That's pretty funny. Most of Marauder's appearances feature him. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't really make sense with what we now know about the Marauder. I guess I, sus I guess I don't know what I'm saying. I gotta think this through.